Thank you very much. Wow, look at y'all. And, and this was af the after party party, so I, I'm really impressed. Bright eyed, bushy tailed. Everybody feeling pretty good? Not too Jay's hungover? Um, yeah, it wasn't, that wasn't good. Did you notice the party last night just kind of croaked when after that happened? Um, anyway, it's great being back. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, so this almost feels like I'm sitting in the coffee shop having a chat with you guys. Um, I'm going to try and do something a little different. So how many people have seen me speak before, probably at this place? A couple of you, right? Um, so I, I want to reference an old presentation, not that one. Um, that was a fun one, but I'm literally, I'm done with it, okay? Stop asking. <laughs> it won't be a sequel. There'll be a sequel from Disney, but I, I, I'm moving forward. Um, actually, I wanted to mention one I did a couple of years ago, which I got a lot of interesting feedback. Anybody here see Weaponized Security? So for those of you who haven't seen it, to give you the benefit of, the de uh, of what happened, it, it, real quick summary, um, I basically showed how I used my firewall to raise my kids. Don't laugh, I literally raised my kids with my firewall. I travel too much, so this is my remote access in. Um, and I, with it, I, I shared like a home, a home network and a whole bunch of like cool, wacky things I could do with the kids, DLP engines. Um, and it actually got it, pretty popular, it got around uh, to the point where uh, I submitted and eventually was accepted to speak at RSA for it, although they had to change the title. And do you remember the fun slide where my wife gave her thoughts on the policy? Her thoughts on their security policy, by the way, was this. Um, they made me take out that slide, so it wasn't nearly as fun. Uh, but I'm bringing it back because just in case you haven't seen it, I'm going to add one more thing that happened after you saw that presentation. Because I, at the end of it, I gave a list of like, look, if you need to protect yourself in your home, you're going to need... Uh, application control, you're going to need DLP, it's all these crazy services you normally associate with your office, you need in your home. Well, I now have to add another one of those services to the list. But let me explain what happened. Um, any gamers in the room? Anybody here play video games? You heard of a game called Evolve? I, I fully confess, I'm not really a gamer, I don't, you know, it's just, I'd rather hack and play with computers, Unix terminal screen, I'm good. Uh, but my son's a big fan of Evolve and he, he came to me uh, he's, he's, you know, well, he's 14 now, he's 13 at the time, and he goes, Dad, I, I've got, you know, this special beta pass to play for this weekend tournament, and you can win prizes, but it's only select people, you know, he's it basically begging me, Dad, please, can I just play, like, can you want to basically play through the weekend, so I thought, oh, what the hell, he's been doing well, and, you know, he got into this, this, this big tournament, so, uh, more power to him, so off you go, and so on that Saturday, he's basically in front of the computer all day, and while that's going on, of course, I'm dicking around in my lab, and uh, up pops uh, uh, a warning on my system. Now, so as you remember, I run a DLP engine at home. Well, my DLP by default is actually configured that under system load, if the system actually starts to experience a, a DDoS type attack, of course, it starts pulling resources from other stuff, like turns off the DLP engine to deal with whatever's coming on. But of course, I actually have an enterprise grade firewall sitting in my house. So this should never happen. I'm just some house, it's just a few people. And all of a sudden this pops up. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And I look at the firewall, I log in, and I am most definitely under a DDoS attack. I mean, I'm being flooded like mad. The box is hurting. However, to its credit, it did its job. It started shutting out some other services and just went, okay, forward packets, let's just keep things moving. And it crippled along. The cool thing was in the house, nobody even noticed. And my son, tournament, played along just fine. Uh, I did some more digging, though, and discovered just before the DDoS hit, my son was fished into clicking on a link. And what happened was he was ranked number one or two in the tournament at that time, and somebody wanted to knock him out. And they tricked him, they found his IP address, which is ultimately me, and boom, in come the DDoS. Ran for about an hour and a, and a half. Uh, and I've heard of stories about this, and my son even told me, oh yeah, there's services we know about. You can go and pay money and if you know where to go. And they even have services they offer you that uh, will find the IP for you and hammer it. So I now officially have to add uh, DDoS to the amount of services you're going to need at home, particularly if you have teenagers that play games. Um, but anyway, th that was a fun, uh, a fun visit. Um, I love my RSA. And then shortly after RSA, something interesting happened. Um, I was staying overnight because I don't like doing the red eye thing. Um, so I, I thought, okay, well, as soon as I got out, uh, I'm going to go grab a coffee. And of course, I'm in San Francisco, so we'll just, you know, hit the nearest Starbucks. You can throw a rock and hit one. But when I get to the first uh, Starbucks, um, I come with this message. We are closing due to system failure. System failure. Boiling water and grounds. What system fails that you can't make coffee? <laughs> okay, what, whatever. There, you know, something bad must have happened here. And the toilet backed up. Whatever. I gotta. What? There's like a hundred more. I walk to the next one. 
sorry, we're having technical issues. And I'm still like, wow, technical issues with coffee. I can camp in the middle of nowhere and make great coffee. What is the problem here? Eventually, and this actually went on and on. So I, uh, so I, I, I was stunned. I, I finally found one that was open. Um, and it turns out it was open because the manager at this store knew how to count. <laughs> it turns out there was nothing wrong with the coffee systems. Their cash system had failed. And since there was no machine to process money, oh, well, business closed, over. But this guy, old school guy, he's like, well, you know, we can take cash or, you know, we can count. We gotta, um, I, it really hit me, though, uh, how impactful this is becoming in our world and how there's a generation coming up behind us that is becoming completely dependent on this. I don't remember what it was like when email didn't work or when you didn't even have it. Um, and what do you expect? We live in a world where, you know, I have to USB charge and manage my uh, glove. <laughs> this, we talk about Internet of Things. I kid you not, it's actually a Bluetooth phone. So when I'm shoveling the driveway, uh, the, the, the uh, headphone piece here and the mics here, if, if the phone rings, I can just touch a button and go, yes, hello, yeah, no. <laughs> you don't have to take your gloves off, hands stay nice and warm. Um, <laughs> I show that to the Israelis, they laugh their heads off. They're like, wow, you Canadians, just, hey, you got to shovel the driveway. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you look at it, though, I, uh, this is actually from, uh, I grabbed from one of the corpse slides. Uh, this is a, a, um, uh, a World for, uh, Economic Forum, and they did kind of a poll of the people. And uh, what's interesting is, uh, the fear of cyber attack and, and all the stuff that we're trying to talk about here, um, at, well, not, it surprises me at rates at all. Because again, I remember I came from a time when, by the way, full disclosure, I am old, right? There's people tell me, I, I, I look young. Oh, you don't look that old. I think they're just being polite, so thank you very much. But I am old, but I remember a time where that wasn't even a consideration. I used to have to debate with customers about whether or not they needed a firewall on their, their internet connection. Oh, it's connected. It's fine. Nobody wants my stuff. Um, but what I thought was really interesting, it's, it ranks actually higher than the extreme weather event. So there's actually people more frightened and, and, and think it's more realistic that, you know, cyber attacks are going to hurt them than, like, say, a hurricane or something. Um, I'm not sure that's entirely true yet, uh, but I am worried that we're getting there. And, of course, the more things we integrate and the more dependent we become on this as a society, the more risks we face from all these other, you know, organizations going to shut you down uh, based on, you know, just cyber attacks, right? The things that happened to Sony. Um, I'd say the things that happened to Ashley Madison, but did you know their, their uh, enrollment actually went up after the data dump? Isn't that weird? Like a whole bunch of people on the internet went, oh crap, there's a place where you go to have affairs? I didn't know that. <laughs> did you hear the part where they lost all the data? <laughs> Nobody cares. But, and that's, you know, and the, uh, ultimately Ashley Madison's failing um, is that they forgot they weren't a hookup company they were a privacy company that's really what their value was and they, I think they lost sight of that um, by the way everybody grabbed the Ashley Madison dump wasn't a lot of fun it's a great way to learn uh, SQL um, I, I when I first downloaded I was gonna have an Ashley Madison party uh, where I was gonna set it up and put like a little web interface and we'll invite all our friends over and anybody can run searches off of the local network and I thought it would be hilarious uh, except when the data actually got down on even my biggest machine a single query was taking, you know, seven minutes to return. Uh, I realized that wasn't going to scale well. So, and then I actually looked at some of the data, saw some names I knew and went, you know what? I'm just going <laughs> to shut this whole thing down. <laughs> We're done. Do you know what included GPS coordinates too? That's a lot of fun. Pipe that stuff right into Google Maps. Put in your postal code. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting outside the area. What, what we really want to talk about is DevOps for the home. So, how this came about was when I did that weaponized security and people saw, hey, you know, all this stuff I was doing at home, there was a lot of questions I get quarter on, hey, how'd you set this up? How'd you do that? And so originally this was going to be a whole how I'd set up my home internal network. And it's kind of spawned over the last year. I really wanted to be a more educational, interactive, uh, a little different. Um, however, during the course of me doing that, um, a lot of things changed for me. I moved to a completely different model. Uh, in terms of how I managed even my own stuff just in my house. Now, these who know me I should explain, I, I, my house is probably not that normal relative to the rest of the world. To you guys, I'm sure this will be fine. I run my own servers. I run my own services. I've always done that. I just I don't know any different. Um, I'm, you know, only recently started getting into cloud stuff. I used to be very anti-cloud. If you saw me in 2008, I was running around doing a presentation called Virtually Safe where I just mocked cloud as, as a ridiculous concept. 
And so now I'm here partly as an apology to go, <laughs> oh man, I, I'm, I'm in the cloud, uh, and I actually kind of like it. Um, a lot of this is, is based on, was really triggered on, and, and credit where credit's due, um, there's a great presentation this came from, uh, where somebody went in depth on Netflix. I'm actually very fascinated with Netflix as an organization, and I kind of use them as my model of DevOps, because here's the challenge with DevOps, right? We always love to throw that term around, but it, DevOps isn't a product. It isn't even really a process. It's actually more like a state of mind, as goofy as that sounds. It's really a way of thinking, a way the whole organization has to think. And I mean the whole thing. Um, I had the opportunity to travel over to Australia, and I met with one of their largest telecom uh, providers who said, hey, we'd really like you to talk to our DevOps team. I'm like, that's great. I get in there and like, oh, here's the network, here's the security, here's a couple of different groups. And I'm like, where's the app people? Well, that's a different group. You've already failed. They have to all be in the room together. And so I'll bring up Netflix uh, in terms of, I love this slide because he starts talking about the differences between you know, their approach and traditional. And you want to know how wacky Netflix is? I'm sure a lot of you heard this, but I'll, I'll share it just in case you haven't. Anybody heard of the, the Chaos Monkey? Yeah, you've heard of the Chaos Monkey? So for those of you who don't know, the Chaos Monkey and Netflix, and they did this quite a while ago, is, an a, is, a, is a service, an application that runs within the Netflix environment. By the way, does everybody know Netflix is just completely run in Amazon. They don't have any data center. They're just basically, they're most of Amazon at this point. They created a program called Chaos Monkey. And what Chaos Monkey does is run around, the, floats around the, the uh, Netflix infrastructure and randomly and without warning turns off servers and services. Think about that. Somebody had to walk into the executive and say, hey, I got a great idea. <laughs> I'm gonna create this application it's going to roam around, and it's going to break everything. And that guy had the foresight to go, that's awesome. Get to it. The consequence of that, though, is the developers have to survive the chaos monkey in order to go into production. Now, they actually experienced a geographical outage from Amazon, which translated into about a five-minute recovery time for Amazon uh, based on their, their past model, which was not good enough for them. Think about it. How many businesses today would love a five-minute recovery time from an entire geographical outage? wasn't good enough for them. So they introduced a program called the Chaos Gorilla. <laughs> Chaos Gorilla runs about once a quarter. Again, it's also random, but Amazon, or Netflix literally shuts down an entire geographical re region in the middle of production, in the middle of the day. And your application has to be able to survive the Chaos Gorilla to get promoted into the Netflix. Isn't that something? Think about that. It's beyond you know, all these little points about agility and elasticity we're talking about. They bake failure into the application services. So I, I'll say this up front that if your application people aren't in the room with your network and, and everybody else, it's never gonna work. So I do DevOps for the home. I happen to be all of those functions. So I'm here to you today, as a couple of you noticed, I, I uh, let the hair come out a bit. Um, I'm here to you today to, to really speak to you on behalf of uh, you know, the, uh, the DevOps side of the house. So I'm, I'm gonna play the, the developer more than the security or the network person. Um, luckily, though, I'm all you know, self-contained, schizophrenic, you know, no problem. I, ju I just argue with myself um, and my cat. My cat likes to hang out with me in my lab, uh, and we chat quite a bit. Um, but before I get into this, I have to address a really big white elephant I'm going to bring into this room right now. Um, and so on those notes, I'm going to ask you to please feel comfortable to steal this presentation in any way, shape, form. Uh, send me a note if you want. I'll send copies here in... in it, all the things I'm doing go crazy. I make no ownership. And then, by the way, I, I will say up front, I'm actually a terrible developer. I'm an awful programmer. I'm lazy. I try to do everything in Perl because it's what I know. Um, I don't mind hacking up someone else's Python, but I'm really not a Python fan. Um, however, uh, I can get by. For home, wife and kids, uh, uh, they, don't, you know, they don't notice the difference. But I'm going to take you back in time. Does everybody remember when the MP3 codec came out? You're going to date yourself then. It was a while ago. Um, I remember that was a huge thing, uh, and right about the time the, the White Zombie Astro Peak 2000 album was popular. So on my old DX2 uh, 46, uh, DX266, and with some help, some friends on IRC, we collectively got together because it took in the neighborhood of you know six to eight hours to crunch out a, a, an album, a CD. Uh, we got together and we started using this this compression algorithm, uh, and actually took my entire album collection and converted it, because here was the thing. I had stacks of CDs my entire life. I've loved music. Always, for every paycheck I got, every week, I go out and buy some album, and sometimes I liked it, sometimes it wasn't. 
I've amassed a massive collection. You could literally pile it in wheel many wheelbarrows. It's unwieldy. It's impossible. Of course, a lot of you probably don't remember those days. You could just carry your albums around and entire collections. But I had literally just tons of CDs. And of course, you'd have a party. Your friends come over and the CDs end up in another thing. I hated that. So this, for me, was awesome. And with the help of a lot of people. So I don't have an issue buying music. This has never really been a problem for me. The problem for me has been I didn't like the format it came in. I wanted something portable, accessible, etc. So long before these services came out, um, I moved to MP3s, as many people did anyway. Um, not out of you know piracy, etc., but just it was easier. By the way, I kept this. I kept the CDs around for a long time because I thought at the time it was like, geez, if anybody ever you know tried to call me on it and I got you know fine, I'll just bring in wheelbarrows full of CDs and go, come on. I bought like six copies of Dark Side of the Moon over my lifetime, right? The tape died, then I got the album, then there was the gold edition, then there was the box set, and then you're going to begrudge me one damn MP3, really? Um, so having said all that, I, I generally speaking, my music is all MP3 based, although I'm now actually moving to FLAC, but that's a different story. Um, now when it came to movies, um, especially again back then, we're going back in time, um, although I knew how to crack and convert movies, the time it took, and the cost and the time it would take to download was just outrageous. In my mind, I'm like, no, just go to the store and get the DVDs. It's fast and easy. Uh, rent them. Um, however, actually, I like to collect a lot of movies, too. Um, however, same kind of problem. I didn't like the media aspect. But I, I dealt with it because it wasn't quite as bad as the, as the CD side. And, you know, I could manage it. At least I thought I could. But then I had, you know, uh, a little child running around. And then you've had to raise a child when they're really young. Um, very low attention span, high energy, very bursts, um, very, a lot to look after. And so I discovered my son really, really liked the, the movie Finding Nemo. Does everybody remember Finding Nemo? Uh, it was a fun Nemo. So, of course, I'd get the DVD, and if you tell my son, hey, Finding Nemo's on, he'd be like, yeah, and I'd throw in the DVD. And even though I'd fully paid for this DVD, I'd have to sit through, like, I don't know, six screens of don't copy it. I'm like, didn't copy it. I bought it. That's the only way you see the screen. The problem I ran into was uh, my son's attention span was not necessarily long enough to make it through that, and boom, he was back off somewhere else. I mean, truth be told, if he would watch 20 minutes of Finding Nemo, that was me collapsing the couch for 20 minutes. I'll take it. But I couldn't even get that 20 minutes because I couldn't get him damn the past, uh, past the damn uh, 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 things. Oh, and then this was my other favorite part. After I get past all these warnings, even though I bought this thing, uh, it would actually still run a uh, preview. Oh, sorry, I jumped back. I jumped ahead. It would still run a preview of some other show, a movie. Um, it was ridiculous. So I actually started ripping movies and doing electronically for the simple fact that I had to bypass these menus if I wanted to get even just 20 or 30 minutes of my son's attention distracted so I could collapse or have a bite to eat or something. Uh, I know it sounds like a cheesy challenge, but after days and days of uh, no sleep with uh, babies and kids, you're like, I I'm doing anything I can to get any minute I can. And all of a sudden, I embarked upon, all right, I'm going to start downloading my movies. I'm going to store them that way, rip them that way. And then, of course, there's TV. Now, with TV, because of the way I travel, um, I don't live in a world where I can be home every night at Thursday at 8 o'clock to watch your stupid show. I don't even like your show that much that I would even care about being home. Thursday. So for many years of my life, especially traveling for work, I just never watched TV. I'd hear people talk about the Survivor thing. I remember it came out. I'm like, oh, yeah, it sounds popular, whatever. Uh, I could never watch it in any sequence. Um, but I, I'd always had TV service at home. And then lo and behold, I, uh, uh, um, I won't, should I, well, I'll have to give away the carrier. So I had the Bell TV service. They introduced this new get TV to your tablet. I'm like, hey, this is kind of cool. Maybe I could even access this while I'm traveling. All right. And so I go to set it up. And while I'm setting it up, it's, it's, giving me this error and, and this problem during the website, but cool website, it pops right up and says, hey, I hear you're having, it looks like you're having problems. Would you like help? I'm like, awesome. And then, oh, this is the, uh, I won't make you sit through that, those slides again. This is the actual capture from the chat. I was, I was stunned. Uh, I got in, hey, welcome, Bells, how can I help you? I said, okay, just trying to get this going. I'm sorry, you've reached Quebec, Bell Home Phone. We don't have access to Ontario, blah, blah, blah. And then it just went into this dead zone. I'm like, hello, anyone, nothing? <laughs> and that was the point where I went, what the hell am I doing? All right, now you can't even deliver TV the way I want it. 
I'm done. Now, credit to the industry. They've, they, they've come along. Unfortunately, they haven't come along fast enough for me uh, because I went ahead and embarked on developing servers and services in my house based on open source available stuff uh, that takes care of all the entertainment aspects within my house. I'm not interested in that. And again, really don't have an issue paying for it. I have an issue of not getting what it is I want. And I realize now I can go direct for sports and, and get this sort of thing. So I want to share with you uh, this complete setup uh, in terms of what it looks like and how it operates. It's all managed through a, a web interface. It's uh, accessible inside my house. Um, there's a, a TV component. Uh, it's got a nice little guide piece there that goes through. Uh, there's a movies and the kids and the wife can go in and request movies and TV shows. You just pop it in. Uh, this thing takes care of, of going out and getting it. Uh, the way it operates is uh, these are scrapers uh, that really just run around looking through, uh, uh, usually uses uh, news groups. Uh, they could use torrent. Uh, there's a variety of ways. Uh, it feeds it to a, a downloading engine, uh, which in turn, well, here's my little downloader. And by the way, in, in this day and age, uh, I'm getting uh, such nice speeds. My whole concern about, well, I could drive down to the store and get the DVD faster. Uh, uh I couldn't even get to the car as fast as these things are coming down now, especially in this day and age. Uh, the pipes, everything. You get uh, some pretty decent speeds nowadays. But anyway, this all comes down, stores on my uh, local NAS server. Uh, I think it was only at five terabits at this point. I've now moved it up to 10 terabits. Um, a little look at the, uh, the storage device. And then uh, for delivery, I was using uh, another XBMC. It's got a spin-off now called Cody. Uh, but I actually went with Plex. Any Plex users out there? Plex is pretty cool. Uh, you can take it with you anywhere. Now everybody in the house has access to Plex. Uh, it's really my content delivery mechanism. Uh, and it's accessible anywhere. Start, you know, you build little Pi Media Center servers with it, tighten your Plex. It's a fantastic uh, application. Um, so uh, then I realized what I actually have here is really an application flow set, like a DevOps kind of thing. And the other issue I was running into was that I have an ESX server at home. Uh, the NAS is a separate physical device, and it's running uh, the downloader components in FreeBSD jails. That'll be important in a minute. I'll talk about it. Um, and then I was running uh, a Unix server with uh, all these components here, a few other things. Um, I'm also running all the components that manage and run my infrastructure in my house, for my corp, uh, again, corporate level stuff. Uh, my ESX server, truth be told, is kind of old. Um, it's a little long in the tooth. It's, you know, a and of course I'm lazy and don't want to spend the money to upgrade it. Um, and another thing that happened was, oh, actually I was in the point of upgrading it, but I had an interesting experience. I went to meet with a customer and we were talking about different stuff. Uh, you guys know where I work, so it's no secret. But the customer told me, he goes, well, we're trying to do some stuff in Amazon um, and we're trying to leverage your Amazon, you know, security services, but they, they don't work. And by the, so way, by the way, if, if, if you're a customer of mine and you want to talk to me about a technical issue, it doesn't work is not a technical issue. You've literally told me nothing. <laughs> what doesn't work? How doesn't work? Of course, as I'm trying to ask this question, this guy's just giving me the wah, it's just, it's all broken. And so I'm like, all right, to be fair, I haven't played with it myself personally, but I have a hard time believing we'd be selling and deploying this if it didn't work. Um, so I went actually back to my hotel room that night, logged in remotely into my home network and set up an Amazon VPC into my house that night. So that the next day we had the follow-up meeting the next day I went, oh, by the way, on that comment about Amazon, I did that in my house last night, buddy. What do you mean it doesn't work? Turns out his issue was he didn't quite understand subnetting. Um, cause as much as we say, oh, the network's irrelevant, you still have to understand a bit about networks. So because I knew this and I now had hooked in this Amazon component, I was like, wow, this, this Amazon thing's kind of neat. And so at that point, like I said, I was thinking about getting an ESX, ESX server. I said, you know what? Maybe I can extend this stuff out into Amazon. Maybe I can extend a bunch of stuff into Amazon. So I brought up uh, uh, my Amazon uh, firewall component. It's just a, an image, runs just like the other one. I'm managing it out of my house, uh, out of the infrastructure in here. And within a minute of it coming online. This is just a sample of the logs. Now nothing's here. I haven't even set up the VPC, uh, VPC behind it. The logs are just drop, 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 except for me to get in and do some VPC stuff. And lo and behold, as soon as this thing comes online, if you look at the timeline here, people just start pop, 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 knock, 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 knock. Far more than I see on my home connection. So if you're bringing up uh, instances 
on Amazon and there is the slightest misconfiguration patch, et cetera, that you're missing, you have a window of about a minute before someone's going to come along and find you. They know about Amazon. They know about the net blocks. They're aggressively, actually, I even I found a list, a, a group once, it was over time, it was a, someone was using Amazon AMI instances to scan for other Amazon AMI instances. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why not? Uh, well, you don't have to pay for the, you know, the bandwidth part across because it's all inter-zone. Um, so, so just an FYI. So if anyone in your organization says, oh, we, we're in particularly corner your, your DevOps team, if they're like, oh, we just moved our stuff to Amazon. It's awesome. And by the way, they probably haven't talked to the security people at all, have they? They're just literally, you're just finding this out. If you have them do that, grab them quickly and run and look because I guarantee bad things are happening. Um, there is nothing safe in the cloud. It's just connected to the network. This, this isn't a different world. So going back to it, so I cr actually create uh, uh, two instances within my VPC. Now this VPC is only connected, VPN into my home network, virtual private cloud. Um, I set up an op server and I call it an op server. It's really just a free BSD server that runs the networking, DNS, all this kind of stuff. I really use it like my network controller. That's a bit of a stretch because truth be told, I have, it's a small network. You got one seven at there, one seven at home. Uh, from a network controller perspective, I could just redirect some DNS and it works great. And I set up a server, I called it dev server because I figured, well, let's see if we develop this stuff, see if it works uh, and get it up and running. And of course, you know, the VPN actually run beautifully, got lots of speed, it, it worked uh, flawlessly across, even to the point of streaming video across of it. Um, so I actually, uh, well, at one point I moved, uh, so I moved the 60 seat couch torrent. And once I got them running on the dev, this is the cool thing about Amazon, you can template, it's just, just JSON templates, you can template the thing and just boom. So as soon as I got a working instance, boom, it goes into production and it's all awesome and uh, I'm loving it and I still have my dev server, I can muck with it, I can test my upgrades before they go in there because every now and then I'd upgrade a component like Sickbeard and my wife would be out of TV for 24 hours because I'm busy and I don't have time to fix it and oh believe me I never hear the end of that um, and, and now I'm actually totally sympathetic to Bell and the support calls they must take from TV uh, because now they go to me um, and from a cost perspective um, it was actually pretty reasonable I've got it kind of balanced out now about 25 30 bucks a month give or take um, one thing I will caution you though when I first did it I went whole hog and I moved everything including I started storing stuff in Amazon going, this is awesome. Um, here's a little bit of a warning. And I think this is probably true with a lot of cloud services. Uh, just a FYI, if you're gonna try this at home, because uh, I don't want you to get caught with what I got. Um, it's incredibly cheap to put data into the cloud. It's very cheap. It's not so cheap if you wanna take it back. And here's what I discovered after a month of uploading data in there and running it, and then I finally went, you know, I got this whole NAS here. Just moved it up to 10 terabits. Um, storage is kind of growing there. You know what, I think I'd rather have it in my house and leverage compute. And uh, of course, to bring it back, uh, the next month's bill was not pretty. Um, so just FYI, by the way, people say, you think about Netflix, they're massive, right? They must have this massive database. And I've heard the comment before, why don't they set up their own data center? Like they could literally be their own data center easily. And I'm betting, imagine the cost they would pay to take that data out of Amazon. They're intrinsically tied together. I just bring that up as something to keep in mind about storing data. Um, however, having said all that, there's a real easy solution. My storage and my data resides in my house. I actually just use Amazon for compute. I just want you to do some, I want some CPU time, send the data my way. And so as a consequence, I've got this, you know, truthfully from my perspective, lovely little setup now, when it first started doing it, there's my uh, IRC client in the corner. Um, yes, I still use IRC. Um, I have my, uh, uh, my, uh, um, oh, which one? Oh, my ops server. So this one's doing all the connections through managing the network, communicating the main uh, network, brings the servers online for me. I've got my dev and my prod. You see the prod's obviously much busier than the, than the dev stuff. Um, and it's all, they're all images. So I could create common scripts, much like now, I didn't go as far as putting in Puppet. If those of you know Puppet, it's, you know, the Puppet Master runs everything. Same kind of concept though, I had consistent scripts that it ran exactly the same on every one of them. Very easy to manage to look after. Um, I thought I was, you know, pretty uh, cool for school. Right? I kind of move all this stuff around. Not only that, I realized playing with some of the Amazon stuff, I could template and replicate this at a ridiculous scale. So if for whatever reason my family grows by, you know, two or three hundred percent in the next while, um, I'm not expecting that by the way, but 
Uh, in the event that it does, um, I have to confess this, this Amazon thing, and, and by the way, this is not to take away from other cloud providers, Rackspace. The reality is, is they're all kind of the same services. They do their nuances, little differences here and there. Um, but the ability for us to scale out and work through it is fantastic. Um, and then to the point where I started building, uh, um, play with the S3 buckets. So I used to run a web server online, long time ago, of course. It was just a dumb web server. I'm a horrible uh, web designer. But uh, I, I just ran it and I'd put stuff on there really just for me personally. Um, however, I ran into a bit of an issue where um, it, sooner or later it's going to get popped, right? I have to come, I've come to that realization actually many years ago, just sooner or later. I don't have time to maintain it. I can't just leave it sitting there. Um, so I just gave up running a web server, much like I gave up running a mail server. I used to run my own mail server in my house until the spam thing just became such an issue. Ugh, it just wasn't worth it. Um, so I actually, uh, let me just see if I've got my... Uh, Oh, I'm still here. I'm going to take you inside the system right now. I still got it logged in. You can't read that at all, can you? So this is the tricky part. I said I want to do something live, and I'm hoping that better. So I have this domain. zip right in and uh, if I go into my what's going on here so, red. so what's going on is I actually have a simple um, actually if I just show you so as you know I run an IRC client I'm not going to show you some of the IRC channels I'm in because you'd be like what the hell is that crap uh, but it's they're interesting let me just say uh, old hacker ones um, I actually have my uh, Twitter is actually tied into IRC and if you're thinking well, what are you doing that who still uses terminals and actually, you'd be surprised. I'm in a terminal quite a bit. Uh, but that's actually not uh, what I use it for. I use it because I log everything that goes on inside of this client. And using a simple Perl script, you guys like, uh, you guys uh, play with Perl at all? More Python, yeah. See, I'm, I'm, we're going to have to have the battle because I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm still hung up on the Perl. And so it's a simple Perl script, grabs uh, the. Um, the, uh, the, the logs generates a little uh, HTML for me and uh, uses the S3 to push it up to, uh, let me just bring my web browser up. So everybody got their, uh, everybody has their computers and stuff here, right? So if you go to www.killhop.cx, what you see is this lovely little scroll. That's uh, my Twitter messages feed. And this is, there's actually some interesting links that pop, pop up in here. I take no, um, responsibility for some of them if you click on them. They're all mostly informational. Um, hacker stuff, weird stuff, um, and free to go there. Um, I've put a link up here to TV, movies, and music. Um, if you guys are, if you got your machines, you can go there right now. Be my guest. Have fun. And what I wanted to show you was I discovered something while I was uh, playing around, you know, FreeBSD jails. And that was Docker containers. Now, who here is playing with Docker containers? Everybody needs to go and look at this technology. Now, truth be told, I really actually did like it better when it was called FreeBSD Jails, because it is actually just FreeBSD Jails. But they put this interface on top of it that allows me to containerize uh, applications. So you're thinking, well, what does that mean? What's the difference? It makes them completely portable, and that I can move them like an application. I can upgrade them independently. I can run them uh, in, in all sorts of ways. So, for example, if you go to killup.cx, anyone there now? If you click on it, you're actually going to see my full TV system here. This is the updated one. I actually use an offshoot now called uh, uh, Sick Rage. Same idea. Um, so this is live right now on the internet. If anybody wants to log in and take a look at it, be my guest. And by the way, feel free to muck with it all you want. Because you know what? It's running inside a container that is compartmentalized its own little world. It's not my real version of what you see that's running in my house that actually manages everything. You're seeing a containerized, a different containerized version that, by the way, has a read-only access, and I can blow up in a second and restore uh, exactly the way it is. And you want to see how powerful these are. Who, is anyone here clicking on the website or has access to it? No one's going to confess to it. You guys are probably scared to click on it. You got it right now? 
Okay, let's play a game. I'm going to go into my... All right, so I'm going to do stop. Is, uh, is anything... Uh, can you access it now? Probably not working too good. Right? How about now? Now I'm going to stop it. Oh, now it's gone. Now it's back. It's literally that fast. That server's up and ready to rock. Now you probably think, okay, why are you showing us that? That's ridiculous. But there's something I, s I saw in that that really uh, opened my mind. And that was, if you, if you think about, um, from a security perspective, uh, what the Docker means. I, I, back in 2008, I actually argued that server vir virtualization had not gone far enough. Where is my just-in-time kernel that launches threads, does whatever it needs, and then poof, can disappear in a puff of smoke, gone. Then I found Docker's, especially with all the controllers they have, and it integrates into JSON templates. It can be automated through tons of automation tools on demand. Now think about this. You can set up an instance. A flow comes in, service the request, and when the request is done, gone. Somebody pops that web server. The next time they connect back into it, poof, original image again. Not only that, you can diff the images in real time and see what's changed has been made. We're looking at now some way of extracting that, maybe doing some threat analysis on it. Uh, it changes the whole game and the scope. And, but this is part of why you need to bring your development team in there. Case in point, those S3 buckets I'm pushing to, you see right now, that's just a flat texture. You can hack that all you want. It's just going to get overwritten by buckets. There's different things we could do than beyond just pure security access. But along those lines, this is my security cat. She hangs out with me in my lab all the time. Um, what does this mean for security? I'm going to bring this back to, uh, to uh, really work and, and business. Um, my security is pretty easy to manage at home because it's fairly small. But if you consider taking this kind of flexibility and capability, this portability to move all this stuff around and dynamically fly up applications, um, and you look at how we've built things over time, right? Uh, what's going on here? What are we doing? We really don't care. Right, and uh, you know we're talking about oh my gosh, the internet. You know, oh it's protected. We've locked it off. Um, I, I don't think that's true. When I go to most data centers, uh, it's really not that way at all. Um, and the analogy, and this credit where the credit goes, this came from a, a gentleman I work with by the name of John Michelson. Um, he describes it as herding cats. Right, this is our security of today is now really just dealing with these herded cats. And if you've ever tried to like direct a cat to do something. Uh, you know how great it is. You usually get scratched uh, or bitten or ignored. Not unlike, you know, how the security team gets treated at work sometimes, right? You're just, oh, scary, scary person. So what does this ultimately mean? You look at, you know, what's the tenements of security? What are we supposed to be doing? Well, the basis, the core of everything we do? Segmentation, right? This is not rocket science. We know this. Customers know this. And theoretically, we can do this today wonderfully. Uh, we have physical infrastructure setups that model this out beautifully so they could create this stack with layers of security uh, in between each component. However, when I go visit my customers, what I usually see is something that looks more like this. Um, and as we're looking at it, trying to figure out how to segment it, there's more stuff popping into it and it's plugged in. And there, don't get me wrong, there's maybe some VLANs, but nobody's really tracked it. Nobody really has any idea why or how. And, uh, but rather than deal with the segmentation, hey, I just threw more threat prevention on the front end. Don't worry about the segmentation. Uh, we're going to focus on that. And oh, by the way, while we were doing this, uh, oh, did we mention we actually moved some services from the DMZ into the back end? And we're just going to punch some holes through anyway. Uh, stop me if this doesn't sound like your environment. Uh, I'd love to talk to you. And then, oh, my absolute favorite part, um, if you're lucky, users are connected through some kind of access control device. In a lot of cases, I've seen them connected right to the data center because... It's a trusted network. I love when people use, oh, it's the user's network. It's trusted. And all I can think is, are you out of your mind? Have you met users on the internet today? You can't trust them. They have no idea what they're doing. They'll click anything. They don't care. You know how many times we've gone on for a, an event, a, a, for like an a incident response, and you find that patient zero? And it's the same story. They're like, well, I got this email, and it looked kind of suspicious. And you clicked on it anyway, didn't you? But that's okay because we have to think about uh, you know, how to create an environment where they can click on anything and anything they want. And so, I, by the way, I blame a lot of this on VMware. 
Uh, although they're not the only hypervisor out there. There's lots of them out there. So truthfully, there's lots of blame to go around. Um, they make it so easy for the server team to sprawl right out and grow that network and security can barely keep up to them. So I, I don't like to leave things on a downer, although I usually end up doing that somehow. Um, it's not my intention. So how can we do it better? How is this supposed to look? And this is where we get into automation. People talking about SDDC and SDN. There's all these concepts thrown around. Much like DevOps itself, it's not really a specific product, but more of a state of mind, a practice, a process behind it, uh, which really is starts with you know, some kind of cloud level management. Now, I don't. This I haven't even listed everything that's in here. Um, there's your OpenStack, your VMware, the vCenter, vSphere, which is probably in a lot of organizations. Uh, you got the APIC. There's CloudStack. There's tons of open source. There's no specific one. They all do the same thing though. As a matter of fact, they all work with each other to a large degree. Uh, and it's really based on being able to handle objects, templated objects, objects and nouns, right? Actions. And this template can tell the hypervisor to create uh, the server of this type that needs access to these things. It'll have all these parameters. But those same parameters could be passed to a network controller, uh, ACI, uh, you know, OpenStack, something, Neutron. There's again, a ton of them. And it in turn can provide the exact virtual network in real time. No hardware is carved out, nothing. Just boom. Okay, here's the network access you need. By the same token, we also have the ability to share this information with security services. So they go, okay, here's your new web server. It accesses the internet. It handles this level of data sensitivity. So your security services can be dynamically loaded up. And this can work across all the servers. It's quite amazing. Even to the point where we're playing with technology now that it receives information, obviously, from the other controllers, but it can even talk back to them and say, hey, network, that host is messed up. We saw something bad in security. They pull it offline, they scan it, forensics, they bring a new one in, automated. We've been dreaming about this. It is literally here. But what scares me is we're going to screw it up like we screwed up everything else before it. We're going to do it. Because rather than create an application stack that bakes all this in, we're just going to go the any any thing and, and see how it works. And then what's going to happen? Oh, now you've got a sprawl of 100,000 VMs or, or a million. And at that point, there's no way you're going to talk to me about segmentation or doing anything about that point. And you'll be living with a horrible, horrible problem. Because by the way, the services that integrate into this are much more than that. But they're much more of us in a great way where you create CPU and memory as really a, a dynamic resource metering, uh, which really gives me a metric. So the point here is I can create an application stack that includes the networking, that includes the security, one self-contained entity, much like I was doing in, uh, in the Amazon. I can meter this. Because the other thing we've got to start thinking about, and I'm running into this, we're talking to customers about SDN stuff, and right away the customer's going, well, what's the performance? And I have the uncomfortable you know, problem of explaining, well, you're thinking about it wrong. And they're like, oh, you're just dodging the question. I'm like, no, you're really thinking about it wrong. You create your application stack of your security components of your network of your service, micro-segmented on its own, this creates a traffic flow that I can easily measure in a software-defined network and say, this service with these number of CPUs and this access and this protection gets this much throughput and services these many users. And when, you know, so 1,000 users, I can take care of at 100 megabits. Woo, awesome. What happens when the 1,001 user comes up? Deploy another stack. <laughs> Go. Scale it across. It's irrelevant. The performance piece isn't. It's just metering. And in cloud bursting, you take that same stack, push it in Amazon, push it into Azure, push it all over the place. It's actually a fantastic opportunity for us to do it and, and do it right. Uh, like I said, I'm just terrified uh, that we won't really know how to do it right, that we're going to go back to our, our usual ways. So by the way, I didn't mean to leave out uh, any other pieces here, uh, and in particular, the Dockers. By the way, Dockers are not the solution for everything. Uh, but they make a nice front end. I don't mean to imply that they've changed the world or they're a piece of the puzzle. And this is where I'm running into problems, particularly speaking with customers uh, and working through some of these challenges. I get it. This is all brand new. And it's very easy to just sit and play with these things and have fun. But let's go back to our friends at Netflix and take a closer look, right? You know, their Netflix business is just do it. Get it done. You know, we talk to, talk to customers like, yeah, yeah, we're looking at an SDN, you know, automation program. Yeah, we got that planned out for the next couple of years. Hmm. You want to build a DevOps type environment, but you're going to use this model. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, we got cloud. Well, actually, you've got a cluster of VMs all mashed and mishmashed together. Um, 
you do, you know, kind of test runs, et cetera. Um, there is integration of several vendors really shouldn't be a problem, you know, moving forward. We've got to start thinking about working together. Uh, believe it or not, one of my biggest competitors over the 14 years I've, I've been at Checkpoint uh, has been a little company called Cisco. You might have heard of them. <laughs> Me too. Um, recently this year, um, I've been working with them. Uh, yeah, I never thought I'd say this. If I don't know what's going to change, if we say things are changing the industry, if that is an indicator, I don't know what is. Uh, we are sitting down together. We are developing together. We're hooking in together. Uh, they have some actually really cool technology that works wonderfully with ours. Um, there's some synergies going on. There is some changes. There's, there's you know, massive upheaval. What I'm worried about, though, is if you take that traditional approach and you try to apply it to this model, you've already failed. It's doomed to fail. You probably ask, well, how do you do this right? Here's the interesting part. It's all virtual. It's all, you know, you carve out a piece of resources, CPU, hand it off to a new team and have them start developing. The plan can't be, hey, you know this 20-year app we've had that's really awesome and the whole company depends on? We need to move into SDN. You've already failed. You have to rethink everything, not just the network, not just the security, but even the applications themselves. How can you leverage newer tools? How can you build this, you know, automation and, and movement and capability around? The possibilities are endless once you get there. I'm actually very excited about the amazing things we can do. But, and, and we'll see if we can get some honest answers, because I know, I, I know definitely some customers out there. But how many are you going to go out and do the same thing we always did, just on a bigger scale? And why? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and why? Because you're probably late to the game, right? There, there's a DevOps team somewhere in your organization that's already moving ahead with this, and you may not even be aware of it. Um, so at this point, all I can say is encourage the conversation. You need to work together as a unit, a group, because I guarantee you'll get this rolled out no problem. Matter of fact, how many people already have uh, 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 their teams deploying stuff in AWS or Azure or Rackspace or anything? Yeah. Were you part of the security team, for chance? No, actually, I did some stuff, but uh, I've got a Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, that fantastic. So now you, but you're using it in a way that you meant to. What I was actually getting, I've running into a lot of environments where, like, we don't use AWS and we have the little scanner tool going to pull up the apps and go, oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> or somebody is. Uh, we talk about shadow IT, you know, or, or, um, or actually people use the term big, bring your own device. I go, I bring my own infrastructure. Right? I can come to work and I can have my entire own infrastructure VPN through yours. Uh, and you'll never see it coming. We've got to think about these capabilities are going to be the hands of people in their house. And I wonder how many people are going to, you know, uh, miss out. And, and make no mistake, you have to go down this direction. This isn't one of those, ah, it's a fad, it'll go away thing. If you do not take this seriously and get together as a group and work on it, you will literally be, your company will literally be that horse and uh, buggy on the road as all these cars whip by you going, what the hell is with these people? You'll eventually get run off the road. Right? Think about the world we live in, right? The, the, uh, the uh, world's largest uh, retail store actually ha owns no retail space, Amazon. Uh, one of the largest, largest transportation, uh, uh, personal transportation company in the world actually doesn't own vehicles. One of the biggest property rental companies in the world actually owns no property. Uh, things are definitely changing and there's capabilities that change really the entire scope of how your business and, and how we operate, how we were thinking. Um, and I just want to impart on you, start having a conversation. We're still early in the game. There's still lots to be done. Uh, don't think this is, I don't want to put the urgency on it. But it is something you can do right now. Case in point, it's virtualized. We can spin this up. We can get this tested. We can get this going. But make sure you're out there having, if you're part of the security team, go find your application team, buy them lunch, ask them what they're up to. If you're application side, go find your security team, your network team. Take them all out for lunch. But the key here is being able to work together uh, to coordinate. When it's just me in my house and I'm the network guy and the security guy and the, the, uh, the uh, developer, it's pretty easy and it's pretty powerful. I can accomplish a lot uh, with just myself in my house dynamically. Right now, because of that container model, um, if we have an outage in, in AWS, a container launches internally of the exact same application, so the family doesn't even notice that something's happened. And then I just simple DNS redire redirection the AWS comes back on. Now, I haven't really had an outage in a while, although sometimes I shut stuff down to play with other things. But that's incredibly, so that whole support problem of my uh, wife and kids, 
really kind of went away. I don't get me wrong, my wife still complains, but uh, now it's not about Audi, it's just uh, I don't like this show or that show. But with that, um, I do want to thank you. I can't wait to read some of these tweets you guys have been putting out. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully you had some fun with this. Uh, I'll give you five minutes back before your next session. Um, and with that, I do want to say a huge thank you guys for everyone for coming out into the SEC tour. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. I always welcome feedback, input. Um, I'm leaving up the, the, uh, the, if you go to the Kill Up site and you want to go muck with my stuff, add shows, remove shows, do whatever you want. I literally don't care. It's a container. I can go click. Yeah, yeah, gone. Whatever you did. Uh, so have fun with it, actually. I'd love to, you know, if somebody can hack it, great. I can diff the file system and see what you did. It'd be fantastic. Appreciate the help. But anyway, with that, thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.